want to thank our sponsor, Aviate Watches, who are releasing their Dam Buster Chadwick Mecha Quartz timepiece, which pays tribute to Roy Chadwick, the visionary aircraft designer for the Avro company, whose crucial contributions played a pivotal role in the success of the Dam Buster raid during World War II. The watch has amazing detail, with one of my favourite parts being the 617 Dam Buster logo as a counterbalance on the second sand. They come in three stunning colours which you can find via avi-8.com or head to the description below for more details and links. Thank you and enjoy. Can you tell us how you became involved in the Eurofighter 2000 project? I, I was very lucky really to become involved in the programme Eurofighter 2000 as it was then, let's, let's stick with Typhoon going forward. Um, I had no interest in being a test pilot going through my Air Force career. Uh, I was at Valley, having flown the F-15 before that. I was instructing on the Hawk and the phone call from a friend said, um, Craig, we're looking for somebody to become a test pilot um, with your sort of experience, single seat air defense, uh, to join the Typhoon program. I thought, Anglesey versus the Typhoon. <laughs> it was a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, I went down to Boscombe Down, had a, a little chat to find out more about it. Turned into a bit of an interview, not, not so much a grilling on what I knew, but a, an interview on how I behaved and what I was going to, what I knew about testing. And then they sent me off to uh, the US Navy Test Pilot School at Pax River in Maryland. Nice. Um, a year there learning the tricks of the trade, the skills, the, the techniques for testing, uh, and most importantly, writing about what you've tested. There's a lot of report writing involved. Is there a lot of maths involved in that? You need a good grip of maths to understand some of the theory, some of the formulae that, that backs up basic aerodynamics, basic mechanics, yeah. and advanced ones of those too. So yeah, there's, there's a good bit of booking to be done. Luckily, I'd done civil engineering at university, so there's a lot of maths, three years of advanced maths in there. <laughs> that wasn't a big problem. Yeah. And what year was this that, that you got involved in the typing? Uh, so I went, did the course from the middle of 95 to the middle of 96, mm -hmm. and uh, I joined Boscombe Down pretty much straight after that. So 97, I think, when I first flew Typhoon. Yeah. So was it a requirement to be a fighter pilot before you went into the programme or could you just be a test pilot flying helicopters or transport? No, the test pilot, test pilot world is, is very specific. Um, you wouldn't ask a, a, a bus driver to test a Formula One car. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have some knowledge of the role that the aeroplane you're going to test is going to do. So if you're testing fighters, you need to be a fighter pilot. Yeah. If you're testing helicopters, you need to be a helicopter pilot. Mm -hmm. so you need to know what the job is so you can tell what's good and what's bad and, and what might need to, be, need to be altered. Absolutely. So what stage was the typhoon at this point when you joined the program? Very early days. Uh, the first two development airplanes, DA-1 and DA-2, were still flying around with tornado engines, RB-199s, in them. The, uh, the seventh development airplane just joined the fleet, DA-7, uh, for which that, that was the first airplane I got to fly, single-seater out in Italy. Uh, so I think total time, less than 500 hours on the fleet at that point, so early, early days. Uh, DA-7, when I first flew it, the, the logbook had 14 hours in it. <laughs> so did that, that's a new uh, car smell? It did have a new car smell. It did a little air freshener thing <laughs> in the front. No, I didn't have that. I'm just joking. But uh, yeah, flying out in Turin in a single seat Eurofighter, you go, oh, this is quite exciting. Was it split evenly between the countries or was it one, uh, more aircraft oh. to one country? There originally, were meant to be, there originally were meant to be eight development airplanes, mm -hmm. costed so two each for Italy, Germany, UK and Spain. Uh, cutbacks, cost savings, they were down to seven. So that meant that poor old Spain only had one D mm. DA-6, uh, with two-seater. Uh, then the, the other three countries had, had two each. And each of the airplanes had a specific part of the test program to, to undertake. Uh, for example, the two-seat Brit one, DA-4, was all the avionics stuff, the, the, oh, the clever right, bits and pieces. Right. Um, DA-2 uh, was handling and envelope expansion primarily. They could all double up and, and when they could all, but they, there was a lot of backup in case something was unserviceable or, or the worst happened as did uh, when DA-6 crashed. And would you be like, would there be a team, would it be like the Brits separately or would you be all talking like, you know, like after a flight, would there be the Spanish there, Italians there kind of thing? Yeah, it was or? very much uh, centralized. Following on the model of Panavia, 
for Tornado, three nation one, Eurofighter GmbH Limited, headquartered in Munich, was where everything was coordinated from. There was a there was a central flight test uh, department in, in Eurofighter that all of the partner companies uh, put in their reports to, and it was all collated and centralised there. Um, sharing was one of the most interesting aspects of the programme. Right. Let's talk about that, though. Tell about sharing that. Well, it, the sharing was all about governments wanting to make sure they get value for money for their investment. So the work share, the value of the work, was very meticulously shared in proportion to the number of aeroplanes that each country was going to buy. So 720 typhoons were on order in total. Britain had 232. So Britain got 232 720ths of the work <laughs> and there was more time and effort spent ensuring that that was correct than there should have been. Yeah, and was there a language barrier there when you were swapping notes as it were? No, all pilots talk with their hands. <laughs> really? <laughs> Did he? I never noticed that. <laughs> hands in my pocket today. Uh, no, but there's, there's, definitely, um, there's definitely national traits involved. You know, the Italians, the Germans, the Spanish and the Brits are, are all very independent, very nations and some had a definite focus on certain bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the chairmanship of the meetings was, was led by Eurofighter mm -hmm. uh, and there was a number of people who did the job over the years I was there and it's making sure that everybody gets a voice, everybody gets listened to and the, the best and most rational answer comes out for it. it you know, you, you put five test pilots in a room and you'll get ten answers, yeah. ten opinions out of them. It's about you know, consensus and deciding which are the important fights to fight. Right. I don't care that that switch is black. When so there's you no think evil it, involved as such? No, there hasn't. There, there can't be. It, yeah. It's all, all, all about, uh, very much in my mind, is what is the f junior pilot on the fighter squadron going to be able to do with this? And I, am I making it as operationally f effective as I can, whilst also ensuring it's as safe as it can be? And was there, uh, like, I've heard like stories uh, like the Typhoon was originally designed as an air, to air fighter, or was it all was originally designed to do like a multi role mission? It was, I think, on the tin it says it's a predominantly an air to air platform, but it will have multi role mm -hmm. capabilities. Now, over the years, those multi role capabilities and the air to surface have grown and grown and grown and grown. And the great thing about the platform is it's very easy to. to run with that basically, yeah. put out, bolt other things on, uh, it's, it's only software is what you say, so, uh, yeah there's a lot of software in there, <laughs> but you know we, you've, you've got a, f a range of weapons that the airplane can carry now that weren't even available when we started designing it. So can you tell us like how you got introduced to the Typhoon, like the program of flying it, like did you have to go through a lot of training or was it simulators, <laughs> tell us about that career, I see you laughing there. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, it, it was, it, again, you've got to remember, it's very early days. There were, there were the odd um, so academic course, ground school, but those courses were, were for everybody in the programme, not just aimed at the pilots. Right. So you, you, you pick up as many of them as you can when they're available. Remember, of course, at the same, before I fly Typhoon, I was, I'm also doing my day job at Boscombe Down flying the Hawk. Oh, really? The, the, oh, the right. Tornado. Uh, but you know, my prime project was to be the Typhoon test pilot. But still, there's not enough flying in there to keep you current, so you've got to do other stuff as well. So I was flying um, trials on tornadoes, hawks, photo chase, all sorts of different things as well. So your logbook is not just Typhoon, it's, it's uh, other airplanes too. So you fit in what you can in terms of academic courses and you've got a whole suite of certificates that you've done the, the radio course or the avionics course oh, or whatever. Nice. Uh, and you, you, you get, but there was no formal like, like if an Air Force pilot coming to join it, you, there's a, you know, six weeks of ground school, whatever it is now. It's very formal, very regimented, very yeah, accountable. It, it was very much self-help. Um, and, and that's kind of the way the world is in test flying. You're flying things that there aren't lots of them. You, you've got to make sure that you know what you're doing. So it's kind of up to you. Um, and the, my first opportunity, as I've said already, is, was to fly in DA-7, uh, the job we had as a test team, and it was multinational. The other pilot was a Spaniard in this. This was the first opportunity the customer pilots had to fly with EJ200s. So uh, the testing was predominantly engine related testing. Yeah. Taking the engine, slamming it, chopping it, reheat, all that sort of stuff. But of course, at the same time, you're looking at 
the handling of the airplane, the avionics and all the rest of it, and, and reporting that if you can find. They end up, at the end of that, we produced a report, something like 400 pages with, you know, I can't remember, maybe 60 or 70 recommendations of little things that we'd found. No big things. Mm -hmm. And most of the things that we, the customers, found, the industry test pilots had already flagged it up and, and there, was a, there was a fix in progress. So did the book stop with the test pilots say like this isn't working but the engineers might say no we want it this way how did that work for you guys? Well there's, there's, there's money, money's predominantly, there's, 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 there's obviously the test pilots, uh, the customer test pilot, the industry test pilot, then there's the program managers, then there's the financiers and all the rest of it. So you've got to, like I said earlier, you've got to pick your battles yeah. and know which ones to die in a ditch mm -hmm. over. So it, Minor things you can let go, but, but, but some you really have to dig your heels in. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the program manager wants it not to cost any more and to be done on time. And the further into the test program you go, the more expensive it becomes to fix things, mm -hmm. retrofitting if needs be. So at some point you're going from a prototype airplane to a production airplane. Yeah. And once you've made that commitment to production, it gets very expensive if you've yeah, got a product. So um, there's you know, key decision points to be made going through the go through the program, feeding in as you know, I started off as a, a customer test pilot, but then moved over and joined the company and became an industry test pilot. So poacher to gamekeeper or gamekeeper to yeah. poacher, I'm not quite <laughs> sure uh, which way. But but really, all the test pilots, whether they be customer or contractor, are about making the best they can for the guys who are going to use it. Yeah. And quite often the either the industry pilot or when I was an industry pilot would whisper in the ear of the customer pilot and say make sure you mention this and that would give that little bit of extra impetus if the customer saying it needs fixing it needs yeah, fixing yeah. The industry pilot saying it needs fixing but oh, it's okay it does a job yeah well could be better yeah of course so let's talk about the EJ 200 engines were, were they always designed to go into the typhoon or was the typhoon worked around the engine you know like that kind of thing with the F-14 uh, you know the engine was originally supposed to get I think the B engine uh, but it didn't mm -hmm. um, to the best of my knowledge the, the EJ 200 and typhoon or EF2 thousand uh, typhoon uh, were always meant to be hand in glove uh, the d decision was based on safety to fly the first two prototypes with tornado engine tried and tested well proven reliable engines you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket and have a brand new airframe and brand new engine flying at the same time yeah. so get the get the basics of the aerodynamics sorted out and then plug in the the production engine and it, it, the production engine went through I don't know 12 or 13 different nice. uh, standards as it went through, improving, tweaking, getting it up to uh, the, the best it could be. An incredibly reliable engine, incredibly reliable engine. Absolutely. So can you talk us through it, like, uh, in quotes here, an average day, like testing the Typhoon at Boscombe Down? What was that like? We never actually had the, an airplane at Boscombe Down. Oh, okay, right. The, the, uh, all the testing was done at the contractor site, so I, I spent a lot of time in a chieftain flying from Boscombe up to Wharton oh, and, and right. back again. So yeah, right, okay. the, the work, there was a couple of little campaigns that happened at Boscombe, but the work always happened with industry, be that in uh, Italy, Germany, UK or Spain. So I would, be, I would go to Wharton from Monday to Friday, um, living in a hotel, going in and out, but very much part of the, the team there, even though I was still squadron leader Craig Penrice, RAF. Um, you know, the program gets written the day before, what's, what we want to do, what's the next test program, who's flying it. Um, and there's always other stuff going on. I, I go to the, um, I seem to spend a lot of time in the lighting facility. There's a, a big bright dome that they could, we could test the lighting of the airplane in the brightest of bright. You don't even think about that. Yeah, yeah, wow. In the brightest of bright sunlight to the darkest of dark night. Yeah. So, you know, sunlight shining on LED displays, you know, go to your ATM machine yeah. and try and type in your pin code when you can't see because the sun's on. You can't have that in a fighter cockpit. No, no, no. <laughs> so the, uh, the, the lighting has got to, it's all automatic, it brightens up and dims down. Uh, cockpit reflections inside a bubble canopy. Oh, so it, it could be um, any number of different little assessments going to meetings. But if it was a flying day, um, you would get the the set of test cards, the script for the flight, you probably get to see that in draft the day before. Go through, make sure you've got a good idea of what's happening. Um, 
the, the scheduled takeoff time would be you know, late morning, early afternoon, typically. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of checks to do on a prototype airplane to make sure that it's airworthy at that time. There's always a lot of work going on. So you'd sit down in the, and you'd have the, the formal brief with the, the test team. Uh, the, the, the brief would be given by a guy called Boffin. He was the, he was the man that you spoke to. He was, he was in charge. He got all the inputs from all the different uh, departments and, and made the test, pl test plan for that flight. So you know, the engine tester guys would want to do a few bits and pieces. The hydraulics would want a couple of bits and pieces. The, the engine guys, as, um, um, handling all the different specialities would would have inputs in and he he, he takes the, the next bits they want and builds it into a workable script for that flight mm -hmm. uh, so the emphasis changed on flight to flight what what the key points were you sit down brief probably take an hour or, or so beforehand you go off have a coffee read the stuff again make sure you know how it was going to go then they get a call that the airplane was ready uh, you drive out Cross the other side of the airfield, jump in, power it up. Everything that you're doing on that, everything you're doing on that flight, is hot mic to boffin on the ground. So there's a, there's a, a, right. a telemetry room. The guy, I don't know, 12, 15 guys sat around monitors. They've got more data that you can shake a stick at. Come in live. <laughs> uh, you think of you know um, space shuttle rank TVs all over yeah, the yeah. place. Lots of people looking at their specific bits. Everybody's got a thumb up or a thumb down to say good to go or not good to go. Um, there's lots of times in, in development that it was not good to go because it wasn't, it wasn't working as advertised. So you've got to make sure it, it's fixed. Talking to Boffin, you know, right, ready to start, ready to taxi. And you, I, you don't have to press a button, just, he's hearing everything yeah. you're saying. So you've got to watch your language occasions and not talk about him because they're all listening. Um, and you get your permission, off you go and just start working through the flight. And, and, and each part of the, the, the script will have a specific height, speed, power setting or, or something, parameters to be at, mm -hmm. to perform whatever it is they want to do, but be that a, a rapid roll or yeah. a, a full stick, whatever. Uh, and you, your job as a test pilot is to get the airplane to where it's wanted to be for that particular bit of testing. And the data comes back and it's just fit, filling in bits of the flight envelope. You, you, you don't fly the whole bit, but you, you <laughs> gradually start in the middle and work to the extremes in yeah. terms of height, speed and power. Uh, and, and fill in the, you know, all, all 6,000 6, flying hours of, of flight testing required across the project. Wow, that's there, a lot. That's a lot of flying. That's, that's a lot of flying. Because uh, like, obviously when you see the test aircraft, uh, I, I don't know exactly, it looks like a black and white sticker, but they're all over the aircraft. Mm. What, is that just a test point or is actually uh, systems in there to, so they can like, read it on the ground? That's, that's predominantly for um, video analysis afterwards. Oh, right. So th those are, you know, those, black and white circles are, 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 are datum points and you, you measure the, the known distance between them all so you can you can clever software does it you can get exact measurements of you know, what what the airplane's doing uh, or has done uh, so there's if if on sorties like weapons releases or, or jettison trials um, there was a photo chase airplane along that would be part of the reason for those black and white circles and for you, uh, obviously, it's not a normal job as such. But do you ever get nervous going into a like you know like a test uh, flight for the day, or was it just like can't wait? How did you feel? The, the, it's, it's, it's nervous, nervousness or, or concern, not because of danger, just because you know some of these test points are really hard to get. Right. They, you're using a lot of fuel and time to, to get to the extremes, and you don't want to. You don't want to screw up, basically. You want yeah. to make sure that you get there. You don't have to repeat the test. So, yeah, there's there's a concern or a nervousness in, in doing the job professionally and, and mm -hmm. proficiently, mm -hmm. not through danger. I mean, the, the romantic bit is that test flying is dangerous. It, it, it can't afford to be dangerous yeah, yeah. today. The assets are worth so much. You've got to make sure you've, you've eliminated all the risks yeah. before you, you go somewhere. And if you find something you weren't expecting, you stop. And, yeah, and did you see a difference from you know the American side uh, of testing to uh, our testing with the type of the European? I, I, well, my American experience is, is purely through the school. I, I, I don't have any first-hand experience of, of being part of an American flight test program. Um, but from what I've seen on documentaries and, and spoken to other people, they, they just put more people into the into the process. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, there's diminishing returns, I think. If you have too many people in, too many, 
too many kooks, as you say. So yeah. I, I don't know. Everybody's still got the same shared aims: safe airplanes, best airplanes. Yeah. So can you talk us through the cockpit? What, did it, does it look like um, it did like when you were flying it to it is now, or was it a completely different uh, cockpit layout? Essentially, yes. It, to, the cockpits that we were flying in the development airplanes were, were essentially what you have now in a production airplane, mm -hmm. with a couple of caveats to that. Um, DA2 that only had two television displays, uh, okay. and instead of the third one, it had a set of old steam-driven flight instruments, mm -hmm. just in case the clever stuff stopped working. Yeah. So you've, you've got um, you've got those backups there mm -hmm. until you've got confidence in your avionics that you don't need them. Um, so DA1 and DA2 had extra steam-driven instruments. The other airplane were all. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of extra switches, a couple of things have changed, yeah. but essentially what we were flying 30 years ago uh, is what's coming off the production line today. Yeah. Software-wise behind it, very different, Yeah. but hardware-wise, yeah. there's very little change. So would you often fly with, um, would you fly clean, would you be carrying tanks, or was that a different like test point? Uh, it all depend. it was all what, um, what the test plan required. Uh, you know, air terror refueling with tanks on, two tanks or three tanks, one tank, all, all have different effects on the, the fuel system pressurization. And when you're taking fuel off a tanker, the guys whose job is the fuel system want to know what the pressures are and how the tanks are filling up. And they're filling up in, in balance, filling up as expected. So the, the configuration of the airplane was you know, to fit what was required at that particular point in testing. And what were the weapons at the time that you were going through the, the testing? What did they want to put on? Did they see like 10 years ahead or was it what we had in the RAF at the time or other European nations? The, the program was, was well attuned to what was required in the, in the future. Right. Um, so things like Brimstone and Storm Shadow, uh, they were, they were I was, the, the day job was testing them on Tornado. So yeah. firing Brimstone, carrying Storm Shadow, uh, on a tornado, and then jumping into Typhoon, going back to air to air. Uh, but you know, now those weapons are, have been cleared onto Typhoon as well. So the, yeah, the program was well ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. The actual um, practicalities at the time, common sense, it's building blocks. It's mm -hmm. step one step at a time. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't clear everything at once. The customer wanted an air to air airplane first. That's what they got. Right. And, and then the dumb bombs came next quite shortly afterwards and now all the smart weapons are on it. Yeah, and I have to ask, what was your, can you remember your first uh, takeoff with the uh, full afterburner? And the, oh yeah, yeah. What was that yeah. like? Absolutely awesome. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a rocket ship and I've been, I've been lucky in flying the Lightning is my first thing and I've flown the F-15, Tomcat, 16, 18, all of those things. I've had, I've had, I've had time in. Um, and if you want to measure their performance, you need a force gauge and a stopwatch to figure it out. Typhoon, you don't need, you just need your backside. You yeah. can tell that you've got more performance in that aeroplane mm -hmm. than anything else that's out there. Yeah, I find it like, amazing from the Typhoon. It's like, it doesn't even need reheat to take off. It's, mm. it's you see it often in dry. It, it doesn't, but God, use it when you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it doesn't. It, uh, it doesn't need reheat for majority. Even at the, the heaviest of weights, it doesn't really need it if your runway's average. But. So tell us about your experience about flying it. What were the best uh, characteristics and maybe some of its weaknesses when you were testing? I, I cannot think of any weakness, wow. to be honest. Um, the, the best bit is, is this philosophy of carefree handling, um, which to explain, in any traditional contemporary airplane at the time, you've got a, uh, an aircrew manual that's got pages of limitations. Mm -hmm. Don't pull more than this G at this speed or don't go faster than this at that height and all the rest of it. Um, Typhoon, none of any of that. You, as a pilot, just ask it for what you want and it will give you as much as it can. Yeah, so it's almost it, like a dream jet, I suppose. It is, and, and it's, it's got, um, at no point is it going to bite you and, and flick or spin or do anything like that because the because the clever computers won't let it get there yeah, now, yeah. There, there is an there is an argument so ah oh, but surely a pilot could eke a little bit more out yeah, of it yeah, yeah. yeah but that's using a little bit more of that pilot's yeah, yeah. brain yeah. where i'd rather just go on with fighting the bad guy yeah, than absolutely. fighting my airplane 
And did you work with the REF when you were testing, or were you completely separate at this point? Or did you like say like a, an F3 might come in for an engagement and see like how you did? Or yeah, that that's, that sort of stuff is more into what you would term to be operational test and evaluation. Right, right. What my predominant bit with and what we've been talking about now is development testing. So you got DT and E, development testing and evaluation, O T and E. Mm -hmm. So development is, is developing the airplane to make it as best you can. Operational testing is making the best you can with what you've got. Yeah, Subtle yeah. difference between oh, the yeah. two. Yes, we, we had, we had um, support from the Air Force in terms of um, target airplanes, uh, uh, um, tankers, um, using the weapons ranges, all the other so, so joint with the Air Force there, but it was the flight test areas of the Air Force, not the front line areas of the Air Force that we worked with. And was the radar quite capable when you're testing? Did you think like when you obviously test in Tornado, you'd be like, wow, this is something? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I'd come, you know, my evolution from the Lightning through the F-15, yeah. um, and all the number of ones in between, the, the, the radar in Typhoon was very capable from day one. Um, it, not a lot of, you know, fettling was a good word. You had to fettle a lightning radar to make it work. You had to play with it, turn up the gain, sort the vertical yeah. roll, all those sort of things. Typhoon's radar does all that, just knowing where it's looking and, and what you're looking for. So it's, um, yeah, chop and cheese, really. Absolutely. So did you enjoy your time with the BEA systems, you know, at war and uh, like testing the Typhoon? Yeah, but from an Air Force perspective, it was, it was great to be part of the team at the early stage. I liked it so much, I joined the company. <laughs> so I, 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 I jumped the fence, as we said. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a small group of people working on something that's quite unique. Quite, kind of quite unique. It's something that's unique. Mm -hmm. um, there's not many people doing it. It's, it's important stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it, yeah, very rewarding part yeah. of um, a very rewarding place to work. And did you, um, oh, were you allowed to chat with your ex RAF mates or current RAF mates? Like, oh, what's this like? What's it like? Or were you... Oh, yeah, well, oh, encouraged. encouraged. Yeah, oh, definitely. Ah. Staying current, I mean, coming from an operational squadron into the test world, uh, your operational skills atrophy. It's, they've got a shelf life on them because they're always evolving. So it's really important that you keep up to date with what the boys are doing on the front line. You know, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you know, there's a number of things in Typhoon I could, uh, could, I could probably think of where we designed it with this in mind and now it's been used in a completely different way. Yeah. Just as effectively, mm -hmm. but you know, evolution doesn't stop in military aviation or any aviation. 